Hi, I'm Anquanette Crosby here at DC's new entertainment and sports arena. You'll find this new hot spot in Ward 8. It's the practice facility for the Washington Wizards and home court for the Washington Mystics. But it's not just about sports. This is also a premier entertainment venue. I'll have more to share about this great space and why it attracts so many artists and cultural events. But first, welcome to Artico, art in your community. I'm with Greg O'Dell, the president and CEO of Events DC. Greg, thank you for being on Artico and thank you for having us oh, here. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. So tell us about this exciting space and what goes on here. Sure, so uh, we are in the entertainment and sports arena. Uh, so that's a mouthful, but we have a lot going on. So we have a world-class training facility for our Washington Wizards, but we also have a beautiful 4,200 seat arena. So we have lots of great events from basketball amateur sports, to esports, to even carnival, carnivals, you name it. So all types of wonderful things, diverse programming that we have right here in the arena. When we first opened, we want to make sure that the nation knew that this venue was available. So we started with the queen herself. We had Mary J. Blige here as our grand opening act. We also had Cage the Elephant, which is also a, a Grammy Award winning artist. And then we also had for our local flavor, we had Wale perform, which was an amazing community event, uh, but he actually sold out the house as well. So very excited, great uh, opening for us, but more concerts to come for us. How long has it been here? So we opened in October, so it's been a labor of love for lots of people, uh, lots of businesses here in the district, and a lot of, frankly, people who worked in this community got to work on not only the construction, but also the operations. And so we're, uh, we're still in our first year, but things are going really well. A lot of exciting things happening. Yes. Thank you so much, Greg. Really appreciate it. Our pleasure. Thank you so much. And here's something else exciting, a filmmaker and artist who brings new meaning to the expression, taking it to the street. Robin Bell has projected his protest messages all around the city. It's his own unique form of activism, and his efforts have gone viral. Now for a change, you can see the work of this guerrilla projectionist from the inside. Let's get a closer look at his eye-opening exhibit called Open. We're at the Corcoran Gallery of Art and Design, and we are presenting the show Open, which is open from February 7th to March 31st. Open is part of a uh, you know, series of shows that examine in the 30 years after the cancellation of the Robert Maplethorpe show. Um, the cancellation of the Robert Maplethorpe show in 1989 was due to political pressure from uh, Republicans like Jesse Helms. And this was a time of censorship. This was at the same time when groups like Two Live Crew were being censored and threatened with arrest for performing their music. Our show is kind of a counterpoint to a larger show that's going to open in June called 61389. Our show is, is looking into the First Amendment, it's looking into censorship, it's looking into um, what does the concept open mean. Open is, uh, it's an action, it's also a demand, it's a way of being. Um, right now we're in a you know, current political climate where a lot of politicians want to close doors, they want to close borders, and they want to close thought and discussions. So we wanted to use the building and use the space as a, as a way to discuss what open means. What makes this show unique is for most of the work I do, people can't actually meet me or see the work. It, they usually will see the work on social media or on whatever mediums they can they get they they access it. I've been doing projections uh, on the streets for a little under 10 years. Uh, I've been in projections in venues for almost 20. I was very fortunate um, growing up to study under a printmaker, Michael Platt, who was a who was a teacher at Northern Virginia Community College and a teacher at Howard University. Um, and you know, I first started out as a printmaker, and I really thought that that was my medium. And then I slowly discovered video and video uh, uh, projections for behind bands and DJs. And it was kind of an organic flow from a, being a printmaker to a video artist. I've taken you know jobs as an editor for TV shows, camera, camera work. I've produced, directed, um, basically anything that's media related, so that I could get my hands on the equipment. And you know, when I have my hands on the equipment, then I can create the work that 
I like to do, which is these kind of large-scale projections. When we're creating projections, it's a balance between the news of the day, um, what we think we can say creatively that will make a more um, detailed conversation, and then the site itself, you know, what will look good on the building and what will work. A lot of our work is very site-specific, and being site-specific, we're directly across the street from the White House. We're directly across the street from power structures that are asking the world to be closed. So by you know, creating a large art installation that says open, it's a direct challenge to those who want to keep things closed. We have different setups that we use depending on the location and depending on the building. We have a projection van that we, we set projectors on and we can pull up and do a projection quite fast. We also use projection carts. Um, we have a, you know, a small but sturdy crew of people who help put everything together from the graphics to filming it to um, making sure the projections turn on. The projections will last anywhere between 30 seconds and 40 minutes. I think probably still one of my favorite projections I've done is the, the, president of, the President of the United States is a known racist and Nazi sympathizer. We projected that on his hotel a few days after what happened in Charlottesville. Um, that one I'm, I'm proud of because I wanted to make a statement. We did a lot of projections around Puerto Rico and about the government's um, basically you know, allowing Americans to be treated horribly down there. I think with the artwork that we create, a lot of times what it does is it creates um, a moment to talk about it, but then uh, you know, from that it can lead, lead to maybe a conversation that's bigger than anything I could think of that could maybe have a, you know, a helpful impact. What I want people to get from my projects and what they see is I want them to have stronger conversations. I want to have a little bit of, just of enough of a nudge to create a little more nuance and detail so that um, the conversation happens. The James A. Porter Colloquium brings together a who's who's list of artists and cultural experts. The focus, African-American art and the African diaspora. This year it turns 30 and continues to feature and celebrate the work of both new and seasoned artists. Artists like Sylvia Snowden, who studied with James Porter when she was a student at Howard University. This April, Snowden is receiving the Colloquium's Lifetime Achievement Award. I was in 11th grade, and my father said we were going to have a talk. I said, uh oh. And so she said, what do you want to do? Because you're going to graduate next year from high school, so what do you want to do? What can you do for the rest of your life? And I told him, the art. I can do art for the rest of my life. And so he said, that is what you need to do. I didn't know I wanted to be a painter. You have to go into art and decide and experience design and experience painting and experience printmaking to know what type of artist you want to do, or at least that's what I had to do. And I would make sure that young people, I would tell them to go outside into different institutions and make sure that you met the people in the different institutions and they knew you and you knew them. That's extremely important. My parents were the people who really encouraged me. Two o'clock in the morning, I'd still be at Howard University painting, and my father would come and pick me up. They, they, I had good parents. When I went to Howard, Howard University was the best place in the world to be to study art. I had the, the most impressive teacher. James A. Porter was a very impressive person. You know, David Driscoll, Lila Asher, Lois Jones. Those people knew their art. They continued their art and they taught too. Neither one suffered. There was no university that I taught that had the dedication the master dedication of the teachers, professors at Howard, not one place. And I taught uh, at Yale, I taught at Cornell, I taught at the uh, University of Sydney, a lot of different places. 
can take a photograph of, of any face, take a photograph of my face, and, uh, and I draw a circle around that photograph, that's an abstraction because I've changed reality. I do not call myself an abstract expressionist. I do, however, call myself an ex expressionist. And I am a figure painter. The human spirit is what interests me more than anything. I work now with acrylic paint and I do impasto. Impasto, it means thick paint. The paint is so thick that I paint on the floor. I can't paint with a, on an easel or standing against the wall because the paint would just slide down. So I have to paint on the floor and I wait for it to get a skin when it's heavy enough to put up. But the thing about that is that you, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. I can't lift any of these. And I paint in series, just like people paint in paragraphs. They're different sentences for a paragraph. They're different paintings in a series. And when the paragraph is at its end, you stop. And when the series is at its end, I stop. Now, how do, I, do I know it's at its end? There's nothing else that I want to or can at the moment say about that particular subject matter. And then I start another one. And what gives me the most pleasure? I get pleasure out of, out of painting. I get pleasure out of the feel of the paint. I get pleasure out of the color. I've made up my mind a long time ago. What I wanted to do is to have children, and I wanted to paint. I have two children. One, a girl, firstborn, is Shell Snowden Butler. And I had a son, uh, 21 months younger, 21 months younger than, than she. And um, he lived here in this house. Both of them were raised in this house. And my son was killed, shot to death. The person who killed him was never arrested. I did a large show about his life. The show was up at the Corcoran. It was a huge show, huge. I think it was 147 pieces. It was huge. I worked hard on that, you know, I worked my little heart out, you know, because my son. I don't like to teach pain. No. The reason I don't like to teach pain is because I don't want to get too involved. It makes me get too involved with it. And that, that takes away energy from my own work. But what I did, what I like to do is to teach the, the art appreciation for one year because that offered me a time to make a comparison between what they do, Western art, and what we do as African Americans. After all of the humiliation that we've been through, all of the detachment that we've been through, uh, uh, all of the constant beating up emotionally and physically that we've been through, as African Americans, as black people, we still create beauty. Aaliyah Rocker has a passion for creating jewelry. Now she says her designs are culture centric. And her company, Rocks and Glitter, has a provocative tagline. Like it, rock it, we'll let her explain. I think I fell in love with making jewelry a few times. Um, I would say the first as a child. And just seeing that, you know, I had the power and the skill to recreate something that I could then wear um, and kind of display my expression, my creativity. It just, it felt really empowering. My tagline or phrase, like it, rock it, uh, came to be because I would be at different events, different markets, and often I would have customers come up to me and say, oh, I love those earrings, but my head's too small or my neck's too short or that color just doesn't look right with my skin. And what I would always say to them is, if you like it, put it on. You know, if it's something that you're drawn to, there's a reason for that, put it on. Make it yours, show people how you can wear it. And so that's where Like It Rocket came from. Primarily, I make earrings. Um, I have started making a lot more bracelets and necklaces. 
My jewelry is unisex. Whoever would like to wear it can wear it. What I want to express with my jewelry is the love of art, of culture, of balance, of composition, color play, of uh, texture, patterns. I choose to do that with materials that you know, do have some cultural relevance. Some of the materials I use um, would be, uh, so would be, so wooden beads. I use uh, bone, so like horn uh, tubes. Um, I use uh, Ghana glass, and so it's a glass that they kind of crush up and then heat up and put back together. I use rubber, uh, acrylic, wire, so all sorts of things. Really nothing is off limits. Um, except I do want to make sure that I can be as eco-friendly as possible. I think there are some aspects of my work that can be considered Afrocentric. Um, but I think it's, while that can be included, there are other things as well. So um, I have a very deep connection to um, the native people of this land, so Chappaquiddick. Uh, my family is Chappaquiddick, Wampanoag. You know, I don't particularly use wampum or, um, you know, jewelry that would scream to you Native American indigenous. Um, there are some elements that would put you in the mind of that. So my jewelry has what I what I put on my website, um, cultural notes. Sometimes I sit down and I have a very clear vision in mind. Um, you know, I saw something that day or just something popped in my head. Okay, when I get home, this is what I need to make. So I sit down, full steam ahead, I know exactly what I'm doing. Other times, I just kind of walk around the studio, pick up things, put it down, go do something else, come back. I'm just not ready to delve into it, but I know I need to. But once I'm actually seated, then I try to clear some space, you know, make sure I have some room to work, and then lay out what I envision. Um, usually that means you know, having a couple rough drafts, so lay it out what I think initially, okay, take these away, add that. I've completed projects and taken it all apart um, because I will not sell something, I will not post something, I will not give somebody something that I don't feel 100% good about. If you wanna get in touch with me for some wonderful jewelry, you can go to rocksandglitter.com, so that's www.roxandglitter.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram, so it's Rocks and Glitter. I'm on Pinterest, at Rocks and Glitter, and Facebook, at Rocks and Glitter. To be a jewelry designer and maker, um, you have to have some patience. I think a little bit of ego, and uh, some thick skin, literally, because you will bleed. But that's how you know you're doing it right, because you are, you are fully invested in the process, and um, you know, some of the uh, materials are so small and some are very sharp, the, the tools, that, you know, there's just millimeters, centimeters of space between you and a sharp object. And you have to stand firm in what makes sense to you and what you, what designs uh, reflect what you want to express. Because there are, there's so, there's so many jewelry makers. I do have a social work background and in some ways that has influenced my jewelry making. Um, part of it is, you know, reprieve. Part of it is just allowing me some time to do something different, where I can focus on something uh, completely different than what some may see as the weight of the world. Sometimes I would come home and feel like I had a hard day. You know, I, I wasn't able to be there for everyone the way that I wanted to. You know, I maybe couldn't do everything on my checklist. <clears throat> but let me come home and let me have some success artistically. I know a piece is finished when it sits well with my soul. That probably sounds a little silly, but um, I, I really believe in uh, the aesthetic pleasure of my product. And so when you can look at it and it feels balanced, and it feels, it just feels right, then I know that it's done. 
Spring is coming, so why not spring into action and check out some art? There's the posing beauty in African American culture. It's at the David C. Driscoll Gallery until April 27th. That's on the University of Maryland campus in College Park. Robin Bell's Open is on display through March 31st. You'll find it in the Flag Building's Atrium Gallery on 17th Street Northwest. And check out the James A. Porter Colloquium. It runs April 5th through the 7th on the campus of Howard University. Okay, so here's something for you to ponder. How do you think African and African American beauty is handled in the media and pop culture? Well, a new exhibit at the Driscoll Center Gallery explores that question and the answer. It's called Posing Beauty in African American Culture. It's a traveling exhibition curated by Dr. Deborah Willis, who is chair of the Department of Photography and Film at uh, the Tisho School of Art at NYU. And she herself is a photographer and very interested in African-American art and how photography portrayed African-American artists. It's an exhibition that is addressing social and, and political issues through photography and the voice of the African-American photographers. This exhibition started in 2012 with about um, 100 some pieces of work by 51 artists. We had to cut a few pieces, but we still have 47 artists represented here. The exhibition is also divided to three sections. The first section, Body and Image, is, is, has some historical pieces. There are pieces by an artist named Sheila Bright, who is uh, from a series of work about plastic bodies. So how girls especially are being influenced from the image and the Barbie dolls. Um, there are works by Gordon Park, who is a very well-known African-American artist. And there are other works that, that uh, portrayed people and how they are portrayed by in, in our culture. The second sh uh, section, and uh, it's called uh, Constructing a Pose, is more about how people creating a very specific pose. For example, we have here a piece by Lyle Harris, who is about, it was commissioned by the New York Times in 2000, it's about how person today, especially African-American men, and uh, are acting, what they are facing in our society today. So he's talking about the anxiety of existence. And the third section, which is about modeling beauty, is going back to showing how people have been modeled and how especially female have been used for modeling. So there is a wonderful piece by, uh, by, by Hank Thomas Willis, which is, he's looking at uh, Jet Magazine and taking advertisement of women who are competing in beauty competitions and how their body has been exposed as well as the measurements and it was, from my understanding, one of the ways that especially African-American women could, could see a different type of, type of body being portrayed in a magazine while they could not see it in a magazine by, that addressed white people. We have a piece by Lauren Kelly, Picking, which is an afro, but when you get close to the piece, you see that the hair is made of pieces of maybe 40 pieces of comb that each one of them you can see that the, the fist, the end of the comb is, is a fist. So the image of beauty and the image of the hairstyle became political. We have another image of, of three photographs of a hairdo by, of a man that on one side it says Obama, on the back it says it has the face of Obama being portrayed in the hair, and then the last, uh, the last one is, uh, is showing in the hair uh, due the word hope. So again, it's a political aspect of the hairdo. This exhibition is important because the curator was very conscious about showing us that beauty has many faces. The beauty is not a stereotype of one type of figure, of body type or, or face or hair, and that's what she wanted to highlight for us. So the whole idea of being accept, of accepting the voice of beauty in our culture.
Well, that's all we have time for today, but it is with heavy hearts that we dedicate today's program to our dear friend and co-worker, Fatima Dejalo Johnson, who passed away last month. She was such a beautiful person inside and out, and we will truly miss her. I'm on Quinette Crosby. Thank you for watching, and until next time, always remember to follow your art. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.